So first, let's start off with a new thing that's happening across ophthalmology that, that may or may not be applicable or needed in our residency program, and that's night float. So night float is something that uh, be, became really in vogue in internal medicine and other specialties when the original work hour restrictions came into play. Uh, and so in any given intern year, you'll have a month that can be on night float. That might be for a senior resident, junior resident. So how that's looking in some programs, it would essentially be uh, a month where one of the residents or two of the residents would actually cover all of the evening call. Uh, that might be a just during the week where rather than be here during the day, they're actually covering the overnight. It could be a, a hybrid where you, you have a night float for the weekend. So for the weekend, they might be on call from 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and then have a Monday off, something like that. As this dis uh, discussion came up at the AUPO meeting, it was actually quite controversial. There's some really good evidence that night float is no less effective and no less helpful and no less healthy uh, than uh, the current system that we have. Uh, so really that one I'll just put out there for residents. We certainly would be interested if that's something that might make sense for a program. Uh, Integrated intern year is something that uh, we all know about well, but integrated internship is now being mandated across the country. And even though there were several, uh, well, there were three full months of opportunity for input uh, from the program director's chairs around the country, when this was rubber hitting the road at our AUPO meeting in, in January, it was as excited, as exciting and as heated as that room has ever been. Uh, several chairs stood up and say, said things like, do you recognize that there are some programs that may not be able to do this? And if we're shutting down programs uh, within ophthalmology, are we really gaining or are we harming our profession? Uh, there has not been any significant change in the number of ophthalmology residents we've been training now for almost 15 to 20 years. So our, the number of ophthalmologists being trained in our country is fairly static, despite uh, the fact that our population continues to increase uh, with the graying of our population. What will ultimately happen, there will be an integrated intern year uh, for, for everyone across the country. And whether that's an implementation over one year, two year, three years, that remains to be seen. And the most compelling argument for this was, if we stepped back and we decided, how do we want to train ophthalmologists? We would never set up a system where we give away one year of training to go train in medicine, where we have zero control over what they learn, how they learn, whether it's a transitional year or preliminary year. We would design it in a way where they can get experience in internal medicine. They can get some experience in surgery and they can integrate with the rest uh, of the body of medicine. But we would do it in a way that was deliberate and thoughtful to prepare them to become ophthalmologists in the end. So with that, I'll just pause for any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, Dr. Jardine. Uh, do, do you see us joining uh, or leaving the SF match because we no longer need a separate match? That's, a, that's an amazing question and you, you've, 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 well, let me just do this. Before I answer that question, anything else regarding uh, integrated intern year questions? So what was the reason for uh, the comment that some programs would have to close down? Was it because they didn't have this? I mean, couldn't resident uh, ophthalmology go, go to another program that did have it and then go back to residency? That, that's a good question. I think for some of the chairs, I, I gathered this was the first time they heard about this, oh. was at the meeting rather than over, it, previous meetings or during the comment period. And so um, let's just take New York. There are a number of New York programs which are smaller, which may not even have an affiliated medicine program with them. Uh, that, that, that's present outside of New York as well. And so that is a pretty heavy lift for them as opposed to a program like Iowa who would have close relationships for their uh, internal, with their internal medicine or their general surgery program. And, and that was really it. It was really just, just something that, uh, that, that kind of came as a surprise to some of these chairs. No one, literally no one argued this is a worse way to train. Everyone said this is better. It's just the implementation, how we get there to make sure that we don't leave anyone out along the way. Just a comment, I'm stunned how long it's taken for this to go through as, as we uh, put this program in uh, 35 years ago. And it's been working without any problem. So I'm just amazed that this didn't really catch on for that long of a time across the country. Because it's, it's a wonderful way to get training 
extra training, you know, before people would really start their residency program. And, and I mean, we pioneered it here. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Nick. Like, like I say, even among the most, um, I'll just say, vociferous opponents of implementing this now, <coughs> there wasn't a single Re, re, person even there that was trying to argue that this is a worse way to train. So it has taken a long time and, and it does, it, I, I think the biggest reason is it just hasn't had a champion to really take this and push it through. Uh, academic medicine is, uh, you know, we, we do things the way we've always done things and it does take uh, a lot of uh, energy to change the inertia of how we've always done things. Griffin? Yeah, so, so two, two final comments on that. It's really interesting. Until the ACGME mandated this, programs really didn't have anything they could go to their graduate medical education offices and say other than would you help us because we like to do this. Now that it's a mandate, it actually gives programs a lot of power. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that I think was, was lost on, on several people there. Uh, the other piece is payment. The ACGME is not telling you really how to do this. We could decide as a program to pay for all four years and decide exactly where our residents go and how and how they rotate and just own four years of ophthalmology. Or we can partner with an internal medicine or general surgery and allow the, the residents to match into their programs and hopefully have some, you know, we'll just say, uh, sway on what the residents are able to do during their training. But at the very least, they have to have three months of ophthalmology in their training during, during their intern year. That, that's kind of the baseline. So more to come on that. And Griffin, I'll get, I'll get to your other comment as well here in a moment. National Ophthalmology Surgical Wet Lab Curriculum. So what this is, there are, there are a number of programs around the country where uh, residents don't really get a wet lab experience outside of sending them to an industry-sponsored event. And the challenge for academic centers is more and more uh, the, those lines, uh, the, the, I'll just say the restrictions and regulations from academic medicine on what is allowed in terms of industry participation and training, it's becoming more restrictive over time. And, and, and there's many good reasons for that. So um, many of you in residency attendings, you might have you know, flown down to the Alcon uh, course that, that's, on their, uh, that's on the Alcon campus in Fort Worth and, and gone down and participated and really dug into the Alcon machines. Uh, currently, Bausch & Lohm offers something where they'll fly you to their uh, institution. Also, um, Abbott, uh, Johnson Johnson uh, will do the same. And, and that's just becoming more expensive for industry and, and less and less residents are able to do it. ASCRS has done a great job filling a role here uh, as well. The, the question to this body from industry has been, would you like to partner with us in a way that we could give all of the residents across the country uh, an equivalent experience so that we would know every PGY-3 entering their PGY-4 year has had this set of curriculum, this type of wet lab experience, and, and at the very least, that's the baseline that we can say for an ophthalmology resident. How this would look, whether it's large regional wet labs like ASCRS has done or the old core program uh, has done, or maybe a program like ours with resources, we could just deliver that curriculum and do our own wet lab. How that looks uh, is really to be determined, uh, but that's gonna be a heavy lift coming in, in the near future. Thoughts, questions? A little less controversial now, but next year's meeting, I think it will, will be a little uh, more controversial. All right, Griffin, to your, to your um, question comment, uh, currently applicants are applying to greater than 80% of all ophthalmology programs. So, so essentially every applicant is now applying to essentially every program across the country. Uh, we talk about getting over 500 applications for four residency spots, and that is real. And that's really now the same, same way across the country. Uh, all programs are inundated. 
Uh, Judith can tell you the, the Herculean effort it is to try and give the due, due diligence and credence to each one of those applications. Uh, many programs, uh, just, just for simple ease, will say, if you don't get a 245 or above, we're just not gonna review your application because they just have to somehow weed down the 500 applications to something that's manageable. Each application that we get right now, uh, it's, it's about 20 pages of, of, of data reading. And some of that is very dense, the personal statement, the letters of recommendation. And, and the amount of time it takes to really dig into any of these applications for, for many of us who have been on the committee, it, it is intense. And so we've talked about this uh, at House Staff Faculty before, talking about different uh, issues, potential options. One of the key issues right now, we use San Francisco Match. San Francisco Match is an early match. Historically, the early match was done because it was a competitive specialty, we wanted to give the unmatched people an opportunity to match into something else. Now, there's a couple of things that have changed. And Griffin points out the integrated intern year. In the integrated intern year, now when an applicant is applying to ophthalmology, they're going to match into their intern year at the time they match into the residency programs. And so one of the, the big, big arguments for an early match is going away. And I think potentially the bigger issue, and I don't know if Tara's here, I know she's on the VA rotation, probably getting ready for cases. <coughs> Tara uh, did almost didn't go into ophthalmology because she and her significant other were going to try and match together. And essentially what we're asking, 10% of applicants to all residencies right now are doing early match, or sorry, are doing couples match. I'll just say that again because I messed it up. 10% of all applicants in medicine to any residency are doing a couples match. So we're now asking 10% of the, the potential applicant pool to be willing to give up matching with their significant other. That, that's a big, big problem for medicine. So there's a lot of things that, that are happening around this. The, the real elephant in the room is that um, the Academy AUPO and San Francisco Match are uh, incredibly closely entwined together. Uh, we were told for all of the kind of ideas and things, San Francisco Match is not going away. Going to the NRMP is not an option with the rest of medicine right now. Uh, and so our opportunity is can we now do something with San Francisco Match that might address some of these issues? Thoughts, comments, questions? I'm gonna jump into one thing which I wanna allow for some discussion because I think I think if your knee-jerk reaction to this is the same as mine, we, we could have a, a pretty interesting discussion for this. <coughs> All right, a narrative letter of recommendation. A narrative letter of recommendation is a traditional letter of recommendation. So if you've been around long enough, either on the admissions committee or certainly in Retina Fellowship, if you get a letter from Paul Sternberg, you know what it's going to be. If you get one of Randy's letters, you know what it's going to be. And these two write great letters. They give you the information that you want. They use terminology that's clear. These type of letters are the exception. Um, when we get letters for ophthalmology residency, it, it, it is just a, a total potpourri of information. And it's really, really difficult to get some of the just, just baseline key information that we need to get. And so is there a better way? So let's just, let's just present this as an option. By the way, when you get this guy's letter of recommendation, you don't know what it means yet. And so that, that's part of the, the issue here. Okay, a letter of recommendation at its core is a measurement tool. So if we think about a measurement tool, you need it to be reliable, right? Measure the same each time. You also need to have it actually measure what it is you're trying to measure. And with this as a benchmark, we can see that narrative letter of recommendations quickly uh, run into some problems. There's incredible variability in the type and depth of information. There's lack of uniform descriptors. Uh, there was a UC Irvine paper that just came out which talked about key words that are indicators for matching an ophthalmology. And if you use things like superlative or exceptional, how likely someone is to match. And, and particularly for a junior faculty, as, as we're trying to figure out how to write these letters, we're just, you know, we go look at some letters that we've seen before and that, that's, a, that's about the extent that we have. So this is called a standardized letter of recommendation. This is actually available now and we did receive some applications. So it's going to standardize a certain portion of the information we get, and then it still allows you to have a narrative portion. This is what it standardizes. 
who you are, whether we as a letter writer feel they're in the top 1%, 5%, 10%, 20%, 50%. 50%. We're gonna put aside the whole challenge of, of we'll call grade inflation on letter of recommendations because that's present in narrative letters. It has the risk to be present here. But let's just say in a perfect world, you actually got this accurate information. That would be extraordinarily valuable to really understand where someone uh, stands in this person's experience. How long have we known the applicant? What's the nature of the contact? How many days you've actually spent with the applicant? What was the grade in ophthalmology on your service? And there, there, um, th these are the only questions, right, with this rubric here. So there are seven questions. Commitment to ophthalmology, passion, enthusiasm for the field, work ethic, grasp of exam skills findings, level of curiosity, asking appropriate questions, works well with peers and coworkers, ability to communicate, caring nature to patients, <coughs> how highly would you estimate the candidate will reside on your institution's rank list? The rubric is uh, top one out of 10, top one third, top uh, middle third, lower third, cannot assess. <coughs> so if we could get this information, that would be incredibly powerful to be able to compare applicants to, to other applicants. Now, let's just pause here for comments, questions, concerns. Acknowledging the flaws in the other way it's done presently, this seems just totally flawed to me because, A, how do you rank somebody within a percentile when a lot of these metrics you might have like very few data points, right? What the narrative allows is if your relationship falls outside of these kind of very rigidly defined parameters, you can still express what the person has done well or what they've shown. If you have to answer these, like either the, the, the person evaluating the person might just grade inflate, which makes it useless, or cannot access, what do you do with that if you're the person now evaluating these letters? Or people are gonna get unfairly kind of placed in these uh, percentile scores. And like the top one, five, ten that was on the first question is gonna be inherently subjected to all the biases we carry with us, all the cognitive biases, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe just how much we like the person, how recent the experience, all those things. Um, I don't know, I just feel like it, it, it'll become a way of uh, sifting through applications quickly that doesn't really, and there's already so many ways to do that, right? We keep trying to like box ourselves in as people into these very kind of rigid definitions. I, I would hesitate to do that more so as we try to evaluate humans. So a number of challenges brought up. I'm just gonna maybe pull out two and make, make sure that I heard this right. So one, we'll talk about grade inflation and bias, right? So I'm gonna set that aside and I'll address that here in a moment. The other is, these are seven characteristics, and then you're going to, again, have this overall, what is your experience with them? And then these, you know, th these are just kind of straightforward, okay? Are these the right questions to ask? Does this allow you to <coughs> capture everything that we should in an app? I think that's a great valid question. Should these be the questions, or should there be less? Should there be more? Uh, the more you have, the, the greater the risk of people checking boxes. Uh, and then the less you have, the less data you're going to get. Let, let me present a challenge. Inherent in every letter of recommendation that we write is a conflict. We have a mentee that oftentimes has done an incredible amount of work for us. They, they've perhaps worked on research projects, they've devoted time and energy. We are invested in their success and actually there's a really compelling argument that I, had in, uh, that I talked with Paul Sternberg about that as a chair of a department, one of your core obligations is to help your medical students match into ophthalmology when they want to. So we, we will just accept there is an incredible amount of investment in that individual. And then the, 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 the other side of that is we also have an obligation to our profession. If I receive a letter from someone saying this is a slam dunk top 1% I've ever worked with, and this individual is someone who is not a good trainee who ultimately um, is not going to be an, a good addition to our profession, then that letter writer, right, has, <coughs> has, has not been at the very least um, accurate and potentially not honest. And so that's, that's the tension that we're dealing with here. We know in letters there is great inflation, and we know in, in narrative, in, in the standardized letter of recommendation, up, up to 30% of these will have 
inflation. So the question then is, if we were to be, if we could get all of our letters in this format, and I'll just continue on and give you a little more, would that be better overall than getting all of our letters in a narrative format? Emmy. Can I suggest, uh, we had a problem in uh, reviewing abstracts for Arvo. So we wanted to uh, have it be educational for the applicant in a way, how to write an abstract. But we also wanted to reduce the burden on the people reviewing the abstracts because we get like 200 that a person would have to review. So what we did, and, and I'm wondering, maybe you've already done this, but we came up with guidelines as what you need in the letter. What, what are the program directors and the committees and residency programs looking for? What do you need, what right. do you absolutely want to see? But you still allow people to be able to add, you know, what they wanted about the applicant. So it's sort of a hybrid. I love that. Yeah. Did, in the back, did you hear what she said? I just want to make sure, because that was, that was that, that's really brilliant. And, and the answer is no, that hasn't been done. But that really is a potentially kind of a middle ground. So let me, let me show you what else is, is in this. So you do have a, an ability to write a narrative portion. Uh, and that narrative portion allows you really two paragraphs to capture what it is you want to say about that applicant. And the irony is when, when we did this just informal poll asking program directors and others to raise their hands, how much of the letters of recommendation are they reading? It was over half that were willing to say they're only reading the first and last paragraphs already, which is what this allows you to do, a 200 word limit. So this is what a 200 word limit looks like. You don't have to read it. Charles Barkley and something about Doug Marks. But the question would be, would that first and last paragraph just switch to what's their overall percentile and a quick gestalt of what, what do their boxes look like on the next part, right? And if it's, uh, it's a trend towards the right or it's not one in five, 10, I'm not gonna read the paragraph. You've lost any nuance in it. Why would it not go that direction? That's fair, so, so if, I, if I'm hearing you right, if we're back here and everything's over here on bottom third, middle third, they're probably not gonna read that portion. That, that's a risk. Um, that, 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 I think that's a valid point and concern. And I agree with Eric. I, I'm uncomfortable with these kinds of things where you categorize people like that, and for lots of reasons, right? You know, it might just be maybe people had a bad day, you know, you only, I mean, I like the questions that say, how much time have you spent with mm -hmm. this person? You know, I think that gives us information that, that's very helpful, but I think some of these are, I don't know, I think it's difficult, so personally. Mm -hmm. Judge, if you don't mind, just could you um, define the problem? In other words, is it that there's so many applications we need a more efficient way to get through so many applications that's, uh, you know, driving, looking at a standardized way that's quicker? Or is there a flaw? with the narratives, is there a flaw? It's a, I'm, I'm I, I, curious, the, is it, the core, current system is too cumbersome and time consuming, or it's flawed? Well, I, I, think, I think the primary issue is this, the reliability, right, and variability. So it can be flawed. And secondary, it, it's, it's just a time issue. And I'll get to some, some, uh, some papers published in emergency medicine, which started this a long time ago, and they, um, there's a dramatic time savings for both the writer and the reviewer. That is, I'd say, kind of tertiary to all of this. This is the issue. I mean, if th this is, I would say, number one, two, three. Next. Well, we're trying to quantify something that may not be quantifiable, and, and that's, that's the, the main issue that we're looking at here. I'm not sure if any of these will get away from what we call the Lake Wobegon effect, which is everybody's above average. <laughs> and so if you, get, if you get a letter that says, yeah, this guy's in the top 50%, they're going to just get tossed on the pile. So that doesn't mean anything. But everybody can't be top 10%. I mean, that's the problem. And when you look at these letters after, gosh, 10 years of you know, being, on the, being in charge of the admissions committee, everybody was top 10%. And every single letter said, this guy is top 10% or this girl is top 10%. And it's the Lake Wobegon effect because, again, if someone has worked with you, you want them to get a residency, you're never going to say they're the top, you know, they're a 35th percent. That's not going to get them a residency program. So I don't know how we get around that Lake Wobegon effect because, again, every letter says every applicant is top 10%. 
a great point in the court, one of the issues, and you'll notice it only goes to top 50%. There is no below, right, to, 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 to your point. And I'll just make one comment, take a couple other uh, uh, comments, and then we'll wrap it up. I, I've had two chairs tell me they want to see every letter that comes across their desk be in this format. But they would not be willing to use this because they have to advocate for their students in a way that they feel this could, could undermine, which again gets back to that, that, that real challenge that we have here. We're not, as a profession, giving accurate assessments, right? just objectively accurate. If, if we were, we'd feel much more comfortable saying, OK, this person's in the top half of, of students that I rotated with. So that becomes a, a, a a real question for us as a professional. Are we doing a disservice to ourselves by not giving accurate information when we try to get our mentees matched? And I think one of the things is when you start thinking about this like in literal terms, like we have what, 12 residents? So I can only say one of them is in the top 10% that I've worked with. It. I know which one it is, too. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with like 20 residents. Right. So I have two that I can literally say are in the top 10%. I have zero that I can say are in the top 1% because I can't even put somebody in the top 1%. Right. Or even 5%, that what, one out of the 20. So it's, to me, if you actually literally quantify it, there's like hardly anybody that's- Yeah, for, for residents, that does become interesting, right? Because they've already differentiated themselves to get into ophthalmology and then get into our residency, which is more competitive. That's a great point. Griffin, a couple more comments, then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the other reason why I see is that with five applications, for me to get my mentee uh, to get to, to get to have the other selection committees have you know get their attention, I've got to use sensationalism because it's it's a numbers game. And I, I think again, maybe the the root issue here is the number of applications, not the letters of recommendation stop. Because if if, if we had a hundred applications. If we had one quarter of the applications to go through, I'm going to spend more time on each one of them. I'm going to be more interested in that qualitative data. Um, so I feel like this is a band-aid to a deeper problem that would be e more easily fixed by getting the numbers down. And that's, I know you've, you've worked on that, Jeff, it's not it's like legal uh, barriers to even limiting the number of applications. You can't tell a student they can't apply to more programs that so I, I don't know how you fix that, but I think this is a secondary issue that we're dealing with, not a primary issue. Great point. And l uh, just last comment. Sorry, I want to make sure that I leave time, Jean. I, back when I was applying years and years ago, I think I applied to 11 programs, and I was told, oh, my God, you're playing, you, you know, that you're crazy to apply that many programs. <laughs> and now I've talked to applicants, and they are telling me something like 80 or 90, Correct. and that's average. And they say they feel that they have to do that because everybody else is doing that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wonder if, you know, if we could do something with, I don't know anything about this match, but if the match program could have, say, maybe 20 included for a certain price, and then they have to have a much higher price for any others. Gene, it, it is a logical idea <laughs> that, that benefits San Francisco match only. Yeah. Because if I have 80 programs that everyone else is applying to, I'm going to apply to 80 programs. And I don't care if it's an extra $10,000 or $20,000. It's just my career. It hurts them financially, too. Yeah. There should be some limit on the number of, of places they can apply to. I love it. All right, we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> so let me just run through uh, paper. Um, 
So I guess, Griffin, the question then is, is this adequate to comment on the qualitative component of who this individual is? Because let me just show you, show you a couple things. Standardized letter of recommendation has been shown to improve the inter and intra evaluator reliability, content consistency, and of course the nature of the relationship between the writer and the applicant. E Emergency medicine has been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, this, is, this is their information. 92% say the standardized letter of recommendation, not the narrative, 92% say the standardized is the top factor in deciding who should be interviewed. 99.3% say that it should continue to be used. But the, the, uh, you don't see that type of numbers for something when it becomes... It's different than ophthalmology. It's, it's emergency medicine and it's yeah. different. Um, it's not as competitive either, which makes a huge difference. I, 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 I love all these comments. <laughs> <laughs> mean writing times, just as an FYI. So we know what we get from these people. We don't always know what we get from others. Is this a potential step forward um, or not? I'm just gonna leave that there and turn the time over to our other speakers. But thank you for your attention. Uh, we, we literally are in the middle of some of the fundamental changes going on in ophthalmic education uh, with, with Griffin now really playing a pretty big role there as well in terms of medical student education as well. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.